Okay, and with that, we are officially live. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Eve Ewing, and I'm the curator of the Black Freedom Lecture Series, and I'm very excited to welcome you back with us this week, uh, where once again, we're going to be in conversation with a really exciting speaker. I'm coming to you live from the city currently known as Chicago, which is the occupied lands of the people of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Ottawa Nations, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk Nations. I'm grateful for their stewardship of this land and invite everyone who's watching tonight to join us in imagining forward the new ways that Black and Indigenous people and Black Indigenous people can lead the way towards decolonization and liberation. And next Friday, April 30th, we have an incredible lecture on Black and Indigenous solidarities with Elena E. Roberts that will be dropping. We'll be in conversation with Dr. Roberts on May 6th. Tomorrow evening, we are releasing a lecture by Ellis Monk, who will be talking to us about colorism. Please, please, please don't miss it. Obviously, an incredibly important uh, issue in our community. And we'll be hosting a Q&A with Dr. Monk next week. Just a reminder that to find out more about that event and all of our events, you can follow us on all the socials and especially check out our website, which is blackfreedomlectures.org. The best way, number one, illest way to keep in touch with everything that we're doing is to sign up for our newsletter, which is blackfreedomlectures.org slash newsletter. Also check your spam because there has been hateration happening in the spam filters. Um, so please check your spam. Um, Thank you to the study, the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture, and to the Mellon Foundation for supporting this work. Before I introduce our guest for this evening, I want to take a moment to once again acknowledge the grave specter of unjust, untimely, and unnecessary death that is uh, striking our communities. Last week, we began with a moment of silence for the memory of Adam Toledo, who had his life taken from him at the age of 13. And here we are again right, having to begin um, to take a moment in recognition of Micaiah Bryant, who lost her life unnecessarily at the hands of police violence. We also want to take a moment to uplift the family of George Floyd, acknowledging that no matter the outcome of the week that has passed, that, um, that, that George Floyd is never coming back to us, right? And um, just to think about how challenging and, and upsetting it must be to go through this ordeal during this week. So um, if you all don't mind joining me, I just want to begin uh, with a moment of silent recognition for those lives lost. Thank you all so much. And we hope to not begin every single week by having to acknowledge the, the unjust and unnecessary deaths of Black people and, and people of color at the hands of police. Um, so let's hope that that's something we strive for, but also very grateful to be in conversation with all of our guests and thinking about all the ways in which they contribute to uh, the dream of, of, of another type of life, another type of world. So I'm very excited to introduce our speaker and our moderator for this evening. Um, I hope that you caught Christina Greer's incredible, incredible lecture uh, that was released last week. It was so provocative. So I'm so excited to have her in conversation with us tonight. First, I'm going to introduce our discussant. And our discussant this evening is a really special person because she's also one of the wonderful people who makes this series uh, happen and, and makes everything tied together so beautifully behind the scenes. Imani Legrone is a Southside native. She's a first year master's student at the University of Chicago Crown, Crown Family School of Social Work Policy and Practice. In 2017, she received her bachelor's degree from Denison University in Granville, Ohio, where she studied psychology, neuroscience, and sociology and anthropology. That's a lot. She is very passionate about addressing challenging issues in our society, while also advocating on behalf of various diverse students and communities. And she will be in conversation with our featured speaker, Dr. Christina M. Greer, PhD, is an associate professor of political science and American studies at Fordham University. Her primary research and teaching interests are racial and ethnic politics, American urban centers, presidential politics, and campaigns and elections. Professor Greer's book, Black Ethnics, Race, Immigration, and the Pursuit of the American Dream, which is published by Oxford University Press in 2013, 
investigates the increasingly ethnically diverse Black populations in the U.S. from Africa and the Caribbean, and the book was the recipient of the W.E.B. Du Bois Best Book Award given by the National Conference of Black Political Science Scientists. Professor Greer is currently working on a manuscript detailing the political contributions of Barbara Jordan, Fannie Lou Hamer, and Stacey Abrams, and I heard that she might be willing to give us the inside scoop on that project this evening if, if we have a moment. Um, just to tell you all a little bit about how our conversation will go. Imani will begin by asking Dr. Greer several questions, um, and then we definitely have time. We want your questions. Some of you all submitted questions over email in advance. Thanks for doing that. We love it. Um, so we'll, we have those questions on the docket. Um, also, some of the questions from social media. So we'll definitely get to those. And if you have additional questions, please, please, please post them in the chat, and we'll try to integrate them if we're able to. Okay, with that, I'm going to turn it over to the two of you. Thank you so much and excited for the conversation. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Dr. Greer, for spending your time with us today. So let's just dive right in. So first, we're going to sort of talk about the state of Black ethnic and Black immigrants. And so my first question for you is, in your lecture, you sort of discussed the concept of immigration status being both voluntary and involuntary. And so I was wondering if you would be able to just explain a bit more about how this distinction changes the way that the American dream is perceived and how that concept of the American dream is framed either for immigrants by their native culture or any other circumstances that they may be experiencing as they come to America. Sure, and thank you so much, Imani, uh, for moderating. And I want to thank Eve and uh, who's the uh, Siyanda. Uh, the three of you have been so great in helping put this together. And thank you, Barb, for uh, <laughs> for facilitating this evening uh, with ASL. So here, when in my lecture, when I mentioned voluntary and non-voluntary, so in the book Black Ethics, I break things down with I use the term Black American, somewhat political, but also just because it's easier than saying African, African-American and African-American, right? So black Americans, I classify as myself, descendants of US chattel slavery, we've been here 15, 20 plus generations. African immigrants and Caribbean immigrants or Afro-Caribbean immigrants as I use them in the book. And so I think how we conceptualize our place in the United States is somewhat different at times because descendants of US chattel slavery did not come here seeking a better life. Right. They are non-voluntary immigrants, as are put in certain books, but they are uh, enslaved Africans. I don't use the term slave. Slave to me is a noun. It's like table, chair, phone. Enslaved African makes it a dual relationship. That means it puts the onus on someone else that, was, that owned a human being and a family. Uh, and it, it makes us sort of step back just a little bit and recognize that the human beings that were part of this economic, racialized economic system actually existed. So those are the Black Americans. And in my book, I call them JVs, uh, because for those of you who may have gone to uh, college, either an HBCU or I went to an HWCU at Tufts, which is a historically white college in Medford, Massachusetts, you know, people always say, like, where are you from? As I asked Imani before we started this call, it's like, oh, I'm from Chicago. It's like, but everyone wants to know, well, where, where are you from from? And so some people are like, oh, well, my people are from Mississippi or Florida or, you know, Georgia. Or it's like, oh, I'm Nigerian. Oh, I'm from Jamaica. You know, and then the from from question. And so those are the people who are descendants of voluntary immigrants. The parents or grandparents came to the United States because they wanted something better for their family and recognizing that they had to have political, social, and economic networks to make that happen. Uh, because this country has a long standing history of anti immigrant sentiments and especially towards black people. So if you don't like black people you got, you definitely don't make it easy for black immigrants to get here. So the types of black immigrants that are able to come here already have a robust understanding of the political, social, and economic networks needed to get here. We've seen laws change, 1965 Immigration Act under LBJ, the 1980s Immigration Acts under Ronald Reagan, crazy enough that actually facilitated some of the black immigration that we've seen. So zooming out, when we think about what the American dream is, and so there are lots of sociologists who have written about, you know, the promise of America. So you've heard lots of immigrant stories. I came here with a suitcase and $20 bill. And I made it happen. But it's because this is a land where you can yeah, ostensibly come from nothing, and then you can own hotels and go to college and end up at the University of Chicago and just have this robust life 
even if you came here, whether it's through Ellis Island or with, you know, two nickels in your pocket and you can sort of become an entrepreneur. But for Black Americans, it's like, well, we know what this country is and we know the full capacity of this country. And so I initially hypothesized that Black Americans would be the least invested in the American dream. Like this country, look at what you do. Look at what you did while we were reading the Derek Chauvin verdict. You shot one of our babies in, in broad daylight in the middle of the street, right? Look at what you continuously do. And then I thought in the middle uh, would be Afro-Caribbeans because of just not necessarily um, geographic proximity, but the, the numbers of generations of, of Afro-Caribbeans who've been migrating here. And then the most optimistic I hypothesized would be African immigrants for a few reasons. One, new, they're by and large newer immigrants. Two, uh, the exit option is somewhat different because many people are coming from African nations where they either cannot go back, or if they do go back, they don't have the same economic opportunities that they have in the United States. So they want to stay here and they want to sort of make it work. And so they believe in making it work. I was incorrect. So my hypothesis was Black Americans would be on this side, sort of absolutely not, I'm not invested. Caribbeans in the middle, Africans fully invested in the American dream. What I found through survey research and interviews was that my African respondents were most definitely invested in the American dream. Black Americans were in the middle and Afro-Caribbeans were the least invested in the American dream. And when I delved a little bit deeper, it was because when I interviewed Black Americans, I call one of the chapters, you win some, you lose some. And Black Americans were like, listen, we know who this country is. We know the people who are in this country. And it is very clear that you can end up with a master's from the University of Chicago, or you could end up going to prison for the rest of your life for some nonsense that someone just says you did. And what are you gonna do, right? And so a lot of Black families are from mixed class families, they're from mixed status families in the sense that some people are doing incredibly well and some folks it's like you got caught up in the system sometimes it's your fault sometimes it's not right sometimes you went to a terrible school no fault of your own and your life chances are dot 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 and then afro-caribbeans being the least invested in the american dream and through interviews i asked i was like well that seems odd it's like well i'm frustrated because i came here at the same time as someone from Korea or Peru or wherever, and my life isn't the same. So I can't just become American. I get to become Black American. And there's something about that Black American status that isn't the same as the American status. And so we know race travels. We've seen TV. People all over the globe know what's happening in this country. So this perception of, of Black Americans in last place doesn't just affect Black Americans, it affects everyone who sees it. And some people are like, well, I don't wanna be Black American. Like, I actually don't wanna be in last place. I just wanna be American. So let me just remain immigrant. Cause at least if I'm a Jamaican immigrant or I'm some sort of Caribbean immigrant, then I have a slightly better circumstance as a voluntary immigrant. And so this is where I came up with the theory of elevated minority. So many people have heard of the term model minority that's often ascribed to Asian Americans sort of in the eyes of whites, they see Asians as this like, you know, beacon, especially in academic settings. And so, which is a highly damaging concept that, you know, certain people capitalize off of. And it still has the, the frame of white supremacy and anti-black racism wrapped up in it. But this concept of elevated minority puts Afro-Caribbeans and Africans slightly above black Americans, but it doesn't ever elevate them sort of out of this black American, this blackness category. And it's really important that we have this conversation and it's a hard conversation to have because we know that if a police officer is going to come to a black neighborhood because of residential segregation africans caribbeans and black americans tend to live closer proximity to one another but they're not going to stop and ask a question before they shoot your child right so they didn't stop and ask philando castile like is your grandmother from grenada or like it doesn't matter they don't care who mike brown's parents are ethnically Right. And so this idea that we are unified because of our black skin, even though we have these distinctions ethnically. So it's a both and conversation that we can have. But we see Caribbeans and Africans identifying with black Americans because they're not protected. Phenotypically, they're not protected. So I'm curious if I were to do this study 
in 20 years or 40 years if Afro-Caribbeans would sort of shift to the middle with Black Americans, having been in the country more generations, like, nah, you know, it happens. You work hard, you succeed, or you don't. And if Africans who are the most optimistic because of their lack of exit option, because of the sort of elevated status, because they tend to keep their last names and not try and assimilate really quickly the way every other non-Black immigrant has done the minute they've gotten to the United States, if they'll swing the pendulum like Caribbeans at some point in time, like, this is ridiculous. Like we were supposed to be able to fully integrate, like why can't we? And so that's kind of the frame of it, but it's a difficult conversation to have because I don't like having conversations out of school. And this is, and we know that there's some tensions between Caribbeans, Africans, and Black Americans. And writing this book, I knew that people reading it wouldn't just be Caribbeans, Black Americans, and Africans. And I didn't want people to misinterpret some of the hard conversations that we still need to have and try and take it as like, oh, well, Africans are the harder working ones or Caribbeans are the special ones. It's like, that's not what I'm trying to say. It's just some people are descendants of immigrants and some people are the descendants of uh, U.S. chattel slavery. But when you sort of, oftentimes we are pegged, especially in academic settings, against one another about who's ambitious and who's hardworking. But we have to remember when we're looking at, say, it's roughly 44 million Black folks in this country, with Black Americans, we're looking at the entire orchard, A through Z, all the trees. With Caribbeans and Africans, we're just looking at bushels. We're just looking at the immigrants who were here. So if you're Black American and you got a derelict uncle who every day is 420 and is a mess, he's here. Whereas with immigrants, well, we have a selection. And if you have a derelict uncle, he's back home. So he's not in this population. He's not in the conversation of who's worthy, who's deserving, who's desirable, and all those other conversations that sort of pit Black Americans against other Black ethnic groups at times in various communities when we're fighting over this you know, idea of scarce resources. But I don't believe in scarce resources. It's America. It's a perception of scarce resources. Because we know if we needed to go to war tomorrow, we would find all the money. So we don't have scarce resources. We've got plenty of resources. We just don't give them to the people who need them. That is a very long way to answer your question. <laughs> no, that was perfect. I was about to say it's very thorough and covers a lot of different things that I had to ask. So thank you so much for that detailed response. I really appreciate it. And based on actually a lot of the things that you were discussing, I sort of want to shift to sort of a conversation about politics. And so you mentioned this notion of the elevated minority status. And so you spoke a little bit about this in the lecture as well, but thinking in regards to our current political climate, you spoke about Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Barack Obama. And I was just wondering if you could further discuss sort of that role in politics when you're discussing the elevated minority status and how it's shown up in these positions, um, particularly in the local context, but also in the national context as well. And just right. sort of how, oh, yeah. Oh, no, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to add in sort of how this modelizes the status of immigrants in a different way than how we would see. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, Eve said that she hoped I would mention the new book and the new book about Barbara Jordan, Fannie Lou Hamer and Stacey Abrams came out of this question where after coming, you know, I got some thoughts on Barack Obama, but I know I'm talking to Chicago folks, so I'll, I'll, I'll rein it in. Um, so this book came about because after uh, Kamala Harris becomes vice president, first African-American woman, first woman, first Asian-American. I mean, all the things, right? Give me all the demographics, put them in a bowl. Um, it was great. And it was a great celebration. And descriptive representation is important. And I will never deny that. And there were lots of people who were writing books, important books, about Shirley Chisholm, who ran for the U.S. presidency in 1972. Uh, she's not the first Black woman to run, but she's the first Black woman to run on a major party ticket. Uh, and I've written about sort of all the Black people who have run for the presidency essentially have been nominated from like Frederick Douglass to Barack Obama. And I thought that that was a really interesting conversation to have from Chisholm to Harris, 72 to 2020. But it's a New York and a Chicago or a New York and a California question because Shirley Chisholm represented Brooklyn, where I am right now in New York, and Kamala Harris represented uh, California. And so we're talking about these two poles in the country. But we know the vast majority of Black folks live in the South. 
And so I was like, but, and then of course there's a conversation about Chisholm's family from Guyana and Kamala Harris's father, who's alive by the way, uh, from Jamaica. And this kind of Caribbean excellence conversation was creeping its way in yet again, where we saw this with Barack Obama and Kenya. And I thought that there was something to be said about Black American women who support not just the big D Democratic Party, but democracy, full stop, right? We saw it on full display 2016 and 2020. Black women will save us. Black women, please save us. Black women, can you save us? Like, when do Black women stop saving us, right? All those conversations. But those are, by and large, Black American women. And so in thinking about someone like Stacey Abrams, who isn't a size six, who isn't fair skin, who doesn't have long hair blow out, right? And all these ways that we know are very real in how Black women show up in the world. And she's not married. And, you know, this is not shade, but like, she's also not married to a white man. I mean, all of these little markers that we have seen. And so I was curious as to like, so we know where, we know a lot about Stacey Evans, but we don't. And I'm fascinated with Barbara Jordan because she's the second woman uh, ever elected to U.S. Congress, but she's the first from the U.S. South, from the state of Texas. And so I thought that there was a much closer synergy and similarity between Barbara Jordan and Stacey Abrams as these two Black women from the U.S. South. But because Stacey is not just a politician, she's an organizer as well, I didn't feel like the story could be complete if I was just writing a story about Jordan and Abrams, the way people are writing stories about Chisholm and Harris. And so I needed kind of like that third trifecta. And for me, it was Fannie Lou Hamer. And so this idea of electoral politics and organizing, grassroots organizing of Black people, of non-educated Black people and educated Black people, like taking everyone together. And so essentially the book, it's a, it's a short book for Cambridge University Press, but it's essentially if Barbara Jordan and Fannie Lou Hamer had a baby 50 years later, it'd be Stacey Abrams. Like that's, that's the crux of the book. But what for me is like the devil's in the details, right? And I, it wasn't lost on me that our first black president and our first black vice president are not black American. And so when I ask my students, you know, we talk about Shirley Chisholm in 72, we talk about Jesse Jackson, shout out to Chicago, 84 and 88 and those campaigns and the importance of those campaigns for sowing the seeds and establishing a real foundation. Jesse Jackson's the one that came up with the 50 state strategy, not Howard Dean, not Barack Obama, right? So many of the ways that Jesse Jackson ran his 84 and 88 campaign, this is how we get black mayors across the country. Mayor Wilson Good, David Dinkins, right? They worked on his presidential campaign and they learned how to do politics in their respective cities and states. And they learned how to raise money in their respective cities and states and build coalitions within their respective cities and states. Harold Washington was already elected in 1983, but other mayors across the country, it's because of Jesse Jackson's failed presidential campaign that we see real black politics being established across all 50 states. Because we've had black people in Alaska for like four generations. So like just even thinking about that is, is really important. But when I ask my students, for example, about Barack Obama, well, what do you know? You know, they're like, well, it doesn't matter, you know, that it's he's not black American. Like it's 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 the same. And I was like, well, Jesse Jackson being from the South Side of Chicago and South Carolina, actually people feel something about that. White people feel something about that. It reminds them of something that they have and have not done in this American democratic experience, small D democratic experience. Um, the great migration, right? It's not just, oh, I want to go to Chicago for jobs. It's like I'm fleeing the South because of domestic terrorism and lynchings on a daily basis. Those lynchings aren't random, right? There are people who actually have jobs and have businesses and are pillars in the community. So there's that. But then when I would ask my students, like, well, okay, so everyone needs an origin story, right? If you run for office, you know, everyone has an origin story. Barack Obama's is perfectly crafted. Kansas and Kenya, like we've heard it, we got it, right? But I was like, so what do you all know about, I don't know, Nigeria? You know, because it's like, I don't know anything about Africa. So like him being from Kenya doesn't matter. It's like, okay, so what do you know about Nigeria? Credit card scams and danger and all the negative things. Okay, Boko Haram, you name it. All right, what do you know about the Congo? Oh my God, child soldiers and machetes and, you know, blood and violence and guns. Okay, what do you know about Kenya? Oh, safaris 
and marathons and I really want to go there and it's beautiful like here and it's like right so even Barack Obama's from one of the good countries right in quotes that people want to visit so the Kansas Kenya thing works because if he said my mom's from Nebraska and my dad's from Nigeria I don't think he'd be the 45th president of the United States because even though people don't know anything about Africa they clearly know enough where they have strong opinions about it. So for Jesse Jackson to say, I'm from you know South Carolina where I didn't know my daddy or my last name for most of my childhood means something to white America, the same way it means something to black Americans who grew up in the South, where the vast majority of black people still reside and definitely resided during that time when he ran. So with someone like Kamala Harris, she's also from Jamaica. Now, when we think about the Caribbean and where people have visited, come back with the beads and the hair braided, like it's from Jamaica. So she's also from one of the countries that people kind of know, but don't know, right? It's weed, it's Bob Marley, it's good vibes, it's great music, it's nice people. So all of these things, and also, this is an important factor. We've never seen Barack Obama's parents. We never saw a black man with a white woman on stage. We never saw them holding hands. We never saw them dancing, right? Kamala Harris's mother has passed away, just like Barack Obama's parents, but her father's alive. We never, we never see the black man that has produced these two girls, right? I know their business, that's fine. But I do think that it's interesting because we don't have a visual to sort of remind us of their respective blackness, even though we know they're black. And so to have a black American on stage, right? Think about all the hell that Michelle Obama still gets. And some of that is because of her black American. Um, I think a lot of it's because of her Black Americans and her South-sidedness um, and what it means to be from a city, what it means to have Black parents, uh, two Black parents, is another kind of conversation. And so that that's kind of always resting in the back of my mind when we think about the four-legged table of white supremacy, anti-Black racism, patriarchy, and capitalism, and how they essentially set the table of what American democracy is and is not and how this country still has not fully made amends with what they have done. I mean, we have a fictitious narrative of who we are. We have an origin story. Like, you know, we talk about Kim Jong-un and Kim Jong-il, like making up stories. It's like, well, so do we, right? We've got Black History Month where, you know, white folks, black folks are learning about Fannie Lou Hamer for the first time. And it's like, well, if you don't know who Fannie Lou Hamer is, you know, let's just say black people know who she is, but white people don't. It's like, you should feel angry that you don't know who she is. She's a part of your country. She organized Mississippi, which is one of your 50 states. So this idea that we're sort of segmented in like, well, that's black history over there. Black history is American history. And if you don't know it, then you don't know anything about your country, right? So like, if you don't know about Chinese Exclusion Acts, if you don't know about the Trail of Tears, if you don't know the ways that we have systemically gone out of our way to try and destroy non-white peoples and low key white immigrants <laughs> when they first got here until they were allowed to become white, right, then you don't know anything about this nation. And so you can't really have an, an accurate story of what present day looks like. So like what's going on at the border doesn't really do anything for you because you don't understand the 250 years of anti-immigrant sentiment that we've always had. Like how the Jews became white, how the Irish became white, how the Italians became white. There's a reason why in Minnesota, all of the Scandinavian folks are one place. There's a reason why in, in Wisconsin, all the Germans are in one place, right? That was deliberate. Like you couldn't just be walking around this country. Like you were segmented, right? When you think about Brooklyn, it's like, that's Italian Brooklyn, that's Irish Brooklyn, right? That's by design. So it's like, it's not like this country is like, oh, come one, come all. That's part of the fiction, right? That's part of the brochure that is never, I always tell people, it's like the brochures of Ritz Carlton, you get there, it's a Howard Johnson. And we're working on it, right? It's a Howard Johnson under construction. Like it's not even like a good hojo, right? And so there's a lack of honesty that we don't have as a nation. And black folks in many ways remind so many people, white people especially, of their original sin, right? Not just kicking native peoples off the land, which Eve started with recognizing. That's that's the original original. That's sort of the, the prelude to the book. But the the real the active sin of bringing people here and like how I look is a product of what went down. Right. How you look, how all of us look is a product of what happened over centuries. And it's hard to face that. And I think it's hard to face it in the political sphere 
And so, you know, we have lots of political scientists talk about new style candidates. And I put like Barack Obama, Hakeem Jeffries, Cory Booker, Adrian Fenty, if you know, if you know anything about DC politics, Harold Ford, Tennessee. You know, I call them like the, the light skin, light eye, Ivy League crew, right? And I like I say that pejoratively and kind of a throwaway comment, but it's like if you look at a lot of candidates across the country, it's not a coincidence. Like that's not a coincidence that we have sort of Ivy League guys that kind of phenotypically, eh, yeah, look alike, right? Because it it doesn't remind people of the same things that that other candidates do. We're seeing some some other diversity, but it's been fascinating to talk about being Black American in this time period because a lot of folks are like well it doesn't matter and it's like but it kind of does still it does and the fact that we've never had a u.s a black woman who's been a governor of a u.s state ever in the history of the nation should let us know something about where we're going where we're not so and and the fact that kamala harris is only the second black woman who's ever been a u.s senator shout out to carol mosley braun state of illinois right who's the first and the and the only up until 1992 and then the only up until Kamala Harris in 2016. So black ethnicity sort of seeps its way into national politics in a way that I don't think that we should devalue Barack Obama or Kamala Harris's accomplishments at all. But I do think it's interesting that we're having a multiracial conversation when we talk about the two of them. We're having a black immigrant conversation when we talk about the two of them. And we're not having a black American conversation when we talk about the two of them. Wow. A lot of a lot of powerful things that you've mentioned. Thank you so much for that. Uh, particularly this notion of sort of like purposeful ignorance, this notion of making a choice to ignore certain things, I think really resonated. And that sort of leads into my next question. So um, you recommended Jane John's um, Hiding in Plain Sight for the recommended reading. And it sort of discusses the disdain that white women have among themselves when realizing that they themselves have voted for Donald Trump in the previous election. And I just wanted to sort of think about, can you share how sort of this revelation that they have impacts the American political system overall? Um, but more importantly, how does this shape how you mentioned this sort of narrow scope about the Republican Party and sort of how that plays a role specifically in how you just mentioned they're sort of taking this choice to ignore certain nuances that have been affecting not only the Democratic Party that we sort of discussed here, but also how sort of that um, in your lecture, you mentioned the conservative mindset that there are um, that is present among um, sort of that Democratic Party as well, and sort of how we can see that playing a role here. Okay, so two th a few things because we got to back up, right? So Eve knows this. My favorite poet is Gwendolyn Brooks. Eve's my second favorite poet. My favorite author, though, is Mark Twain. And everyone's like, huh? Mark Twain by far is my favorite author. Because I don't think that there's anyone, for that time period that he wrote, I genuinely don't think that there's anyone that captures white America and black America, but like white America in a way that Mark Twain does or did. And it's because he was broke all the time, he was terrible with his money. So he always had to write books so that staunch racists and abolitionists would wanna buy his books. So you get like this, complete hologram story and however you're reading it, you understand. I say all that to say, the way Mark Twain writes white women has opened my eyes. I haven't gone to school with white girls and then white women, but the way he writes white women and the way he always talks about like, stop, stop being fearful of the ones in the South, y'all. <laughs> like it's the ones in the North that you keep both eyes open, right? And oftentimes the ones from the North married men from the South and then they, got enslaved Africans as wedding gifts and moved down there and they had to learn how to be women of the South. And so this performance of cruelty was something that was really important. When we're thinking about Jane John's article, so when political scientists started collecting the data in 1952 to 2016, the article's called Hiding in Plain Sight. And so it looks at white women and how they vote in presidential elections. We see that white women have voted for the Republican Party candidate every single election cycle except for twice, 1964, peak LBJ, who's my favorite president, right? This is after Kennedy's assassination. He zooms into office, everyone's voted for LBJ, fine. That's the one time that white women's ever so slightly vote for the Democratic Party candidate more so. And then 1996, peak Bill Clinton before all the scandals, boom. 
And that was also like after the year of the woman. So it's not 1992, it's 1996. So in the political science literature for years, we thought that there was this gender gap. People taught, taught it. Women vote for Democrats, men vote for Republicans. Okay, that's what the data said. Except for when you disaggregate the data, that is not what the data said. White women vote for Republicans, period, full stop. Black women vote for the Democratic Party candidate in such incredible numbers that we pull the data to make it seem like all women vote for the Democratic Party candidate, which is not true. So we know that on presidential elections, roughly like 96% of Black women vote for the Democratic Party candidate, right? We are immune to the Republican Party. We do not want anything that they are selling. And it's because we're the canaries in the mine, right? So if you think about West Virginia, we're the ones who go into the mine and we're like, danger is ahead. It's what we told you on 2016. We told you again in 2020, right? So like all this pink hat wearing and crying the next day, what's that gonna do? You should have listened the first time, right? When we told you <laughs> eight months leading up to this. That's neither here nor there. We do know though that people consistently vote against their own interests. And as I said before, if we have a country that's predicated on white supremacy, anti-black racism, patriarchy, and a certain type of racialized capitalism, white women we know have upheld patriarchy since the inception of this nation. The same way you don't need men to uphold patriarchy, you don't need you know white people to uphold white supremacy. We've seen it. Ben Carson, Tim Scott, you know, Clarence Thomas, I mean, the list goes on, right? So, and, but white women do a really, really good job of upholding patriarchy. But I think it's really important to remember the way that we have constructed race and every country constructs it differently. So if you've ever been to Brazil, they construct it one way and Jamaica constructs it another way. We construct it our way and we're pretty, you know, it used to be the one drop rule. Now we're sort of, you know, trying to finagle, but like, remember Barack Obama got in trouble when he put on the census black, he didn't put biracial. He's like, well, I'm a black man. Like I show up as a black man. What do you want me to put white? Like, no one's gonna believe me. So, and it doesn't, you know, for him, he was like, why put biracial? Like I present as a black man, my life is a black man. So this is what we are. This is, that's a construct. We made that up. That's the rules that, you know, I didn't make the rules, but you know, those are the rules that have been made. And so what I find fascinating about white women, especially white women in the 21st century, protecting the Republican party, protecting sort of conservative ideologies that go against them, not sticking up for gun laws that are killing their own children in their schools, right? This isn't an inner city problem anymore. This is like gun violence is rampant. Opioid crisis is rampant. Like, you know, you hate healthcare and the ACA, rampant. Like it's killing your own people. But they know that whatever the abuse is will only be but so much because they're the only ones who can make white people at the end of the day. So this, and Mark Twain writes about this. So it's this wild, powerful position where you can be subjugated and abused in policies, local, state, and federal. But at the same time, you know that there's a certain line that will never be crossed because you're the only one that can perpetrate and perpetuate the project. I can't, <laughs> those are the rules, right? I mean, and, and we don't make the rules and we can't change it. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how fair skin or whatever it is, or whatever ethnic group that may be new from whatever country, unless you are a certain type of whiteness, right? And this is why I find it fascinating with the census. It's like, now the census doesn't want to know just if you're white. It's like, are you white Latina or are you white? Because we know in the DR, you guys make up your own sort of racial categories. And I need to make sure that like, your kind of white is the white I'm talking about. Because we know Cuba, Venezuela, Argentina, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, some people are like, oh no, I'm white. And they look like us and it's like, Okay, well, that's not the American rules. So now we need to actually get a little more specific because we can't have certain people walking around here saying they're white because whiteness is a protected category in this country. And so what's interesting, going back to your very first question with, with black ethnics, you know, back in the day, this country was whites and non-whites. And it's like, we decide who's white and we keep all the non-whites over there. I actually talk about my book, we kind of shifted to, we still have that, but I think in some ways we also have this black non-black conversation where it's like there are a lot of people who are trying to not be in the black category and that's black immigrants as well so that's a, a, a throwback to the previous conversation but i do think that white women vote against their interests because um they know that a to a certain point they'll be protected and b race trumps gender 
and it has, and it continues to do so. And I think the only people who are shocked are social scientists and not any of the old black grannies who stand in line for eight hours to vote. I mean, this is like, you know, people are like, Joe Biden, why did, you know, why did the Democrats choose Joe Biden? It's like, because black people know white people. We don't get to go to the polls and just have pie in the sky voting however we, we'd like. We don't do that. We have to be strategic. We're the most strategic voters. We have to think about ourselves, our family, our community, and what is this white man going to do? We do. We have to think about that. And that's why hardcore leftist politics have never been something that Black Americans have been into or really, really pushed in a lot of ways, because strategically, that's just, it doesn't tend to work wide scale because we, we know who else is in the electorate. We also have to remember that, as I said before, 95% of you know, Black women vote for the Democratic Party. That doesn't mean that we're all the same type of Democrat. They're all different types of blue. So all of our ideological diversity is trapped in one party. So we have your hardcore progressive Black women with your moderate to conservative Black women who are like, I can't be in the Republican Party. I'm a Democrat. But they're conservative on lots of issues and we're all under the same umbrella. So we're constantly making negotiations, knowing how other people within our own racial group and our own party and our communities are voting and also keeping an eye on the fact that like, why folks ain't voting for Bernie? So what, either we get another four years of Trump, like we go with Bernie as our, as our nominee, which half of the black people were like, no, we don't even like his ideas. Like we're not progressive, we're, we're moderate. Like, so it's not even like, you know, <laughs> that's the choice, but let's just say he was selected. Black folks would be like, we told y'all don't do this. Like ain't no white people voting for this man at all. Except for a small little pocket. And then we get four more years of death and destruction, which black women told you. So it's like, go with this guy. Problematic, yes, but stood by this black man for eight years and never, never gave him any guff. Didn't try and take him out. Didn't try and undercut him. Never did it, right? Most black people don't know why. They've never had that, that experience. So that's something that we have to sort of always have this 360 degree view of politics and not just what we want, but what is a historical reality in this country and the capacity of white America in their behavior of inclusion. Because for many of them, it's a zero sum game and inclusion for them feels like a loss. We're, and black folks are like, no, 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 we can all come one, come all, right? We can split this pie and like, we're fine. We can always make more, right? We always find, find enough for everybody. By hook or crook, that's just what we do. And it's like, that's not how white America views politics. It's like, well, if you get to vote, then that means my vote is less. We're like, no, 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 that's not what it means. It's like, well, I mean, if you get to go to a good school, then that automatically makes my school worse. No, that's not what it means. It's like, well, if you have a good neighborhood, then my neighborhood must not be worth anything. It's like, that's absolutely not what we're saying. It's like, but that is sort of how black inclusion is oftentimes viewed in every single type of policy. And so we see sort of this prevention of policy and its inclusion because white America views any sort of gain for another group as a loss for them themselves personally. Thank you. That was super powerful. Thank you so much. So um, based on the different things that you've shared, we've gathered quite a few questions from the audience that's watching right now. So sort of shift. I love questions. <laughs> Great. <laughs> So the first question that's come in um, says, and you're new, and some of these we may have sort of addressed, but you sort of hit on this one a little bit, but maybe if you can speak to it a little bit more, they're asking in your new research on Southern women organizers and politicians, do you include size and aesthetics as their larger women? So sort of having that mention, how you mentioned Stacey Abrams. And yeah, I sort of, I briefly sort of have a sentence about it. I don't really go into kind of the aesthetic too much I kind of sort of let it be out there. Um, you know, for someone who talks a lot about Black aesthetic, Tanisha Ford, who's a historian who's at CUNY Grad Center, does amazing stuff with sort of like Black women in dress and sort of mm. larger aesthetic. Um, and so I, I look to her work for people who are doing that. Mm. I mention it in passing because I do think it's important, but it's, it's just as a reminder, right? I think what I focus on a lot more is this idea that there are these black women, all of them known for their oratory skills and sort of this kind of shock and awe. It's like you know, watching a polar bear walk on two legs, I guess. It's like, they're so amazingly eloquent. It's like, cause they're brilliant. 
<laughs> what else did you think? I mean, the end. Like, yeah. I, I don't know what to tell you. But it is interesting, you know, and I do talk about their oratory skills a lot because they're able to persuade men. They're able to persuade black men politically, which is one set. And they're able to persuade white men, which is another set. Um, and so I, that, that's kind of what I focus on for the most part. Okay, great. And so now the next question speaks sort of to your personal experience. It says, in your experience at Tufts and the Pan-African Student Org that you mentioned, the African and the Caribbean immigrant students broke off into their own selected orgs. Did the Black students and descendants of U.S. chattel slavery have any org or community of their own as well? Well, what's so interesting is so like, you know, most schools call it the BSA, right? But Tufts being Tufts, it was like the Pan-African Alliance, which already was like a, an attempt to be inclusive, right? So it wasn't just the Black Student Association. It had gone through all these various iterations. So when the Caribbeans and the Africans kind of broke off and formed their own separate groups, they still maintained membership though in the in the BSA basically. So the and there were so few Black Americans <laughs> in the actual university. So like the PAA, aka BSA, was was our set, and Caribbeans and Africans were in that set with us, right? We had our monthly meetings, we did all the things. But every now and again, the Caribbean Student Association, they'd have the fashion show or like, you know, uh, people would cook food and like we'd all have, you know, collective potlucks and things like that. So to just showcase their respective countries and sort of educate the larger Tufts community about their respective Caribbean nations. Um, Tiffany Unique, I don't know if you all are familiar, uh, the novelist is my year at Tufts and I'm just obsessed with her writing. She writes, she's from St. Thomas. Uh, we, she was on that trip that I referenced when, you know, Black Americans like, what do you mean don't hang out with black kids? Like, <laughs> what kind of question is that? But um, I always I always like to think about her because she said on that trip, this is the week before school started, I'm gonna be a novelist. And I'm always fascinated by people who who say it and just have like a vision of like she said and and whenever we talk, and I'm like, You remember you said you were gonna be a novelist, we we're 18 years old. And she was like, I don't remember saying that. And I'm like, but I do. <laughs> like it stuck with me because I was like, this woman said she was gonna be a novelist. And, and you know, I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> Let's party. So um, I think the takeaway from that is the dual identity of the Caribbean and African students. So they had this both and because, you know, when we all, you know, there's Cape and House, which is like the black house, right, where we'd have parties. It's like, well, when the cops came to like break up the parties where there was no drinking and no drugs, right? Nobody cared that you're from St. Thomas, you're from Nigeria, you're from Ghana, you're from Chicago. It was just parties over, black kids, right? And so there are certain experiences that we had, black people in Boston, right outside of Boston. But nobody cares that you're first generation or second generation or third generation. It's like, you're the black kids at this prestigious HWCU. So we have a couple more questions that are mm -hmm. coming in. Um, this next question says the ADO, ADOS, which ADOS, is, yes. Yeah. American de uh, Descendants of Slaves group online has adv advocated for Black Americans, but also used a lot of xenophobic and problematic tactics and ideas, including connection with Donald Trump and harassing trolls. Do you feel that this is some way for Black Americans descended from chattel slavery to advocate for our specific histories while still working towards solidarity and positive Black politics? Yeah, I steer clear of the ADOS movement and they love my work because clearly no one has read one single word, right? Because I, I'm not advocating for us to be better than Caribbeans and Africans. I'm not advocating for us to like not work together. The whole central theme of the book is how do we have substantive coalition building? What policy issues can we figure out where we are actually aligned so that we can get more as a collective, as a group? So that's the antithesis of what Ados is saying. So I'm like, read the book and please don't call me, right? I find them really problematic because they're so um, conservative and homogenous in their thinking that they sort of turn into MAGA, right? They become anti-immigrant. They become sort of this, dare I say, supremacist, 
black supremacists, white supremacists, but they, they're, they're way too partnered with so much of the rhetoric of white nationalists, um, kind of cherry picking those issues. Uh, and so I find a lot of their rhetoric very dangerous and counterproductive to a lot of the conversations we're trying to have. So when Eve starts the evening off saying how we can think about black and indigenous and black indigenous people, and we know that some of those debates are going on in Florida, Seminole Nation, um, both, both sides of my family are from various parts of Florida. And so I've thought about those conversations quite a bit. We know that, you know, there are lots of black folks who are black and, right? Not just African Caribbean, but like black and Dominican. So we've got language, we've got, you know, totally different cultures. Um, and I find it to be, you know, like a little dangerous because there are quite a few black Americans, especially folks from the South Side, where it's like, well, I mean, one of your grandparents or great grandparents is from someplace not Mississippi and Alabama. So does that mean that you're no longer like authentically black? Like, I don't understand what that question means. Right. And so at the same at the end of the day, if we're all fighting for liberation, justice and freedom, I don't understand this like uh, it like antagonistic attitude towards Caribbeans, uh, especially when so many immigrants, black and otherwise, are actually like, hey, can we lock arms because of safety in numbers? And like, can we figure out how we can work together? Like, we get it. You guys had a rough go of things. We're having a rough go of things. Like you guys are still having a rough go of things. So maybe if we like team up, it could be some sort of unified effort so we can fight this larger white nationalist system that clearly is still reigning, right? And in certain places, it's more of an apartheid system because it's like the numbers are small, but the power is large. So I find that movement um, troubling. And I find it troubling that I think they've seen the title of my book, but has not read the book. And if they did, I'd probably have mentions in my my Twitter feed left and right. Okay, so we have one question that's related to that from another viewer. Um, Dominique asks, I come from a background of college admissions where these distinctions were sometimes acknowledged, but rarely. How do you think the history of affirmative action policy has and or should have mattered in this? Yeah, that's fascinating because it's sort of, the question is how do we like rectify the situation, right? Because there are some folks who came here, where it's like your parents came here just fine, right? Like they came here to go to the University of Chicago and they actually didn't experience, they might experience some like du jour racism, trying to get a cab, trying to get a house or whatever, but it's not the same. I am still thinking through how that shakes out because that's also a larger reparations type question, right? And sort of how do we, undo some of the specific harm that was done to particular people because i mean for me reparations has to be an institutional conversation like i don't think it should be money and cash money in someone's pocket because that just goes back into white institutions and then we pay taxes on it so like how's that helped us as a as a group but i do think that there has to be something different about black americans and the restitution and sort of affirmative action or whatever it may be um but i don't know how to do that i genuinely don't um, and I think about it a lot, uh, but you know, like someone whose grandparents or say like great grandparents were Caribbean, but they live in Southside Chicago, like they might have a, a sort of life experience as someone who's black American, whose great grandparents were from Mississippi, um, just because their great grandparents came here in like the turn of the century. Um, so like, yeah. I think that they should be involved in some of these conversations of affirmative action and reparations or whatever it may be. But I don't know. Like, I just don't know how that happens. And so that is why I am not an economist <laughs> to figure that out. Um, and I think that there's some, I think my, my bottom line though is for me, it has to be institutional change. I am thoroughly not interested in the government giving me a check for what's equivalent Realistically, it's probably gonna be like fifteen hundred dollars. And be like, okay, Negroes, we're done. <laughs> we ain't gotta say nothing. Get over it. We're done. We give you your money. Beat it. Don't ever complain again. And then it's like, so I still give this black money to all white institutions, right? How's how does that change anything? Because all we've done is actually make white people rich <laughs> off the government's money. And then there's that. Um, I do think and. I wasn't a fan of this up until a few years ago, 
But, you know, for anyone who's been to South Africa or like thought about truth and reconciliation missions, I do think that that's a powerful thing. When I was in South Africa, I was like, what is this? Okay, you said sorry. Big deal. Like, what else? Um, but I do think in conjunction with whatever we figure out for affirmative action, reparations, whatever it may be, it has to have a truth and reconciliation component. You have to recognize what you've done. I don't want you to just sort of give money to an institution. It's like, well, why'd you do that? It's like, I don't know. Let's just keep it moving. It's like, we've never acknowledged it. And we have to. And I think some people have to sort of say it for past, but then some people have to say it for what they've done today or last week or 10 years ago or 50 years ago. And I never thought that it was like something that's really important. But when you think about someone sitting on a pan in front of a panel saying, here are all the things that I did and I contributed to, me personally, I think that that's a really powerful thing and I think it's, it's necessary. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Bonnie. We have one final question. This is more of a logistical question in regards to how you were thinking through writing your book. Um, someone's asking, were you cognizant that not only Black people may be reading your book and how did you balance sort of messaging to different audiences at once? That's a great question. That's a hard question because this is an extension of my dissertation. So for those of you who are in graduate school on the call, you know, getting a PhD, you know, this ultimately becomes, you know, oftentimes your first book. It was really, really, really hard, right? Because I'm having conversations that are really personal to me, right? Like this is, I care about Black people. I'm very clear. Like the only two things I really care about are cities and Black folks. And I don't care about cities because Black folks live in them. So it's like, I'm having this conversation trying to figure out how can Black people come together even closer, right? Even though we've hurt one another at different times, right? And we know that. We know that Africans and Caribbeans have said stuff about Black Americans. We know that Black Americans said some things about Africans and Caribbeans, right? And so you, you talk to people who like were the one African kid in their all Black school, right? Or, you know, whatever. It's not just whites. We're not talking about them right now. And if you notice in the book, I'm like, I'm not talking about y'all. So welcome. Here's the first academic book. Where you're not the star. That was also a hard thing to sort of get through Columbia because everyone's like, what do you mean having a book about black people with no white people in it? I'm like, yeah, well, they're the shadow. We get it. But like, we can actually have this conversation. It was really, really hard because I knew that not only black people would be reading it, but these are conversations where it's like, we got to have these like in house. And so I never wanted to be the person who's like, why are you putting all of our business on Front Street, Greer? Like, we haven't resolved this. And so I do think that there are times in the book where I'm, I'm very gingerly in my analysis. And I think that I am writing in a way that Black people who know and feel a certain way about and care about these debates can read what I'm trying to say. And people where this is the first time thinking about it, they're just reading it. It's like, oh, okay. But it's like, you know, when I'm talking about where you're from, from, you know what I mean, right? And we know how that, that question can be weaponized against Black Americans at different times, depending on where you are. Um, and when we think about like what this country has promised and what it provides and how in many ways Black Americans are like, hey girl, I know, like, come on, <laughs> like, we'll help you out. Like, I know you were shocked. Oh, you thought it was gonna be different? <laughs> you thought you were special. Oh, isn't that cute? Like, no hard feelings. Right, and so these are, so there are ways that I, I felt like I was kind of writing sometimes in a dual frequency, but it was definitely hard to write. And I think that anytime you're writing about black people, about issues that we haven't fully uh, resolved as a culture, as a group, but we know that we're not writing it, you can't say like, if you're not black, stop reading right here. Um, it's difficult, it's difficult. Thank you so much for sharing it. Thank you for being a fantastic moderator. Yay, thank you so much. Oh, I'm so I'm so grateful to both of you for this uh, illuminating conversation. Um, it was illuminating even though it's now dark where I am, but it was still illuminating. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Greer. So for those of you that didn't catch it, the book that we were talking about quite a bit today was Black Ethnics, Race, Immigration, and the Pursuit of American Dream and of the American dream. And we will be giving away some copies of the book, which is very exciting. The way you can get um, the book is uh, we'll be sending our newsletter out next week. And we would really appreciate your feedback and hear what you want, what you think about the lectures and all that good stuff. And um, also, if you caught uh, Professor C. Riley Snorton's lecture last week, we also have a um, 
uh, evaluation form about that. And so if you fill it out, you'll be entered into a giveaway to get a copy of the book from um, Semicolon Bookstore, which is a Black woman-owned bookstore here in Chicago. So thank you so much again, Dr. Greer. Thank you, Imani. That was an incredible conversation. Speaking of uncomfortable topics that we as Black people have not yet resolved but need to work through, next week, again, we'll be having a lecture. Uh, uh, we'll be having a Q&A with Ellis Monk about colorism. His lecture on that will drop tomorrow evening. And as always, the best way to keep in touch with us is to sign up for our newsletter at blackfreedomlectures.org uh, slash newsletter and follow us on all of the things. Imani, thank you so much. Great Dr. job, Greer. Imani. Thank, thank you, you so much. much for the invitation. This was wonderful. Thank you. And thank you.